Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Jesus, from life's first cry to final breath, he, he and he alone commands my destiny. Man, what good truths that is. For God has saved us from our sin and brought us into the tender care of Christ, the shepherd and overseer of our soul. Man, what glorious truths we sung about this morning. So today is August 14th. A week from today will be August 21st. That's how days and weeks work. But in my household, in my life, August 21st is a special day. It is the day that Taylor and I got married. So a week from today... Taylor and I will celebrate our six-year anniversary as a married couple. It's been good. It's been a little hectic uh, over the past six years. Um, you know, Taylor, if you know Taylor, she is truly a gift from the Lord to me. And while it, I do not believe that I could have asked for a better wife than Taylor, these past six years have by no means been a perfect six So raise your hands in the room if you've been married longer than six years. All right, so that's most of you. It's a good thing that Christians are guided by the Scriptures, not our life experiences. For today, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 through 7, and it is about marriage. But before we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, I think it's going to be appropriate for us to establish some introductory principles, some foundational ideas by looking to the opening chapters of Genesis. So in Genesis chapter 1, we see this, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So in Genesis 1, we see a rhythm forming that kind of echoes throughout the scriptures that God is good, and what he does and what he commands is good. And we're going to be kind of unpacking that in our Meadowbrook curriculum and our life groups really over the next four weeks, applying it to the that we're living in. So I'm excited to see how that gets unpacked in our life groups over the next four weeks. But the foundational point I want to draw our attention to is that this, is that God and his, his ways are unchangingly good regardless of what the culture says. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 1. That's what we see in Psalm 145. That's what we see in Proverbs 3. That's what we see in John 1. That's what we, receive, we, we see in Revelation 21. We see the abundant goodness of God and His ways. Yet in every age, every generation from Cain onward, the wicked have called into question both the goodness of God and the goodness of His ways. And today, in our day, this is particularly happening with God's plan for marriage. Now, hear me say this. This is not merely a problem for my generation, but something that has been in our culture since the 50s and the 60s. For each of us in this room, whether you're 85 or 5, we have lived our entire lives in the midst of of a culture that has rebelled against God and his plan for marriage. But like I said, it does not matter what the culture says. God is unchanging in his goodness. That doesn't mean that he just merely does not change, but that he cannot change, and indeed he does not even need to. God is infinitely good, and his, his ways reflect that goodness. For it is his ways and his ways alone that we see in Genesis and we see throughout the Scriptures that are, his ways are designed to bring about our fulfillment, our wholeness, our peace, our shalom. But the problem that we have is that none of us are good. None of us live out his good ways perfectly. But what we've been singing about this morning is that there was one who was good, and his name was Jesus Christ, fully God fully man, and he perfectly obeyed God's law 
on our behalf. And he died on the cross, the righteous one, in the place of sinners, bearing our curse. And after being buried for three days, what we've just proclaimed is that he rose from the grave. He holds the keys of death and Hades in his hand, and he is alive forevermore. And he has ascended to the Father's right hand, and he has poured out his spirit to dwell, to indwell and empower all those who repent of their sins and turn to him in saving faith. And he does so in order that we who are in Christ might enjoy the abundant life of holiness. What does he say? He says, I have come. Contrary to the enemy who comes to seek, steal, and destroy, I have come that they may have life in me and have it abundantly. So that's the gospel. On the other hand, you can choose to walk in sin. But sin, or in this context, the refusal to submit to God's way for marriage, is a traitor. We see that in Habakkuk too. We see it throughout the scriptures. So sin will tell you things like this. Porn is no big deal. It's just between you and the computer. Or submit to my husband. You can forget that. Or love is love. Who are you to tell me who I can marry? Or she needs to learn her place. No matter the claim, hear me say this, this is very important. Sin always proves to be a liar. It leads you to destruction while promising life. It is only by the grace of God, only through faith in Jesus Christ, that you can know the peace and the wholeness that you were created to know. The gospel, what it does is it brings us into relationship with the good God who empowers us to walk in his good ways, and as we're going to talk about today, his good ways as it relates to marriage. And this is important because understanding the gospel is crucial to understanding marriage. For God established marriage in creation as a picture of Christ and the gospel, or Christ and the church. We see in Genesis chapter 2, God bringing Eve to Adam, presenting him, her to him in this first marriage ceremony. And Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 refers back to Genesis 2 and says this. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So while the principles of marriage apply to all people, not just to Christians, and why by God's common grace we see non-believers having healthy marriages from an earthly perspective, for us who are in Christ, the gospel is meant to determine the way we approach our marriages. I don't think it's just Paul that wants us to see that. I think Peter is drawing our attention to the very same truth today in our passage. As we reflect on the truths of the gospel, we'll begin to understand how our marriages are supposed to work. And as we apply those principles into our marriage, and we experience some success, and we experience some failures because of our sinfulness, we better grasp what our marriages are to look like. So, and then as, I mean, as we better grasp what the gospel is. So as this, this cycle really kind of, it's pretty cool that the more we learn about the gospel, the better we understand our marriage. And the better we apply those truths to our marriage, the better we understand the gospel. And it leads us to better love God and to better love our spouse, who is your nearest neighbor. So with these two things in mind, we're going to turn our attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. And before we get into the whole passage, I want us to draw our attention to two words that start verse 1 and verse 7, I believe. And it's the word, likewise. Peter uses this word likewise to draw our attention to what he had just talked about in uh, chapter 2, how he had just brought to a close, talking about the gospel that was happening, uh, that Christ was achieving at the, at the cross. And he's drawing both husbands and wives to the same referent point, and that is Christ himself. Now, he's doing so in different ways, but they are both being drawn to look to Christ. For wives, the likewise refers back to Christ and his humanity, and trusting himself to his loving and just Father. And for husbands, the likewise refers back to how Christ is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. 
This likewise connection is important because if you miss Peter on this point, you really miss the whole passage. So with this in mind, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women of, who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's pray. Father, we have now read your word. The word that you inspired by your spirit, the word that testifies of the goodness and glory and holiness of your son. Lord, your word is true. It is righteous. It is good. I pray that your spirit would teach us today by your word, that you would convict us, that you would comfort us, that you would lead us in the ways of your righteousness. For Lord, you are good. You alone are good, and your word is true. Teach us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So from this passage, I want to give two words to the women in the room, and two words to the men, and then a final word to both together. So to the, to the women, first is, wives, submit to your own husbands. Notice the phrase, your own husbands. I'm talking about the relationship of marriage, not the relationship between women and all or any man. But the Bible is clear. Men are to self-sacrificially lead their wives in love, and wives are to respectfully submit as their husbands lead them in righteousness. Now, hear me say this. How that looks in a particular context varies from house to house. For instance, a husband is not abandoning headship if he heeds the wisdom of his wife in a particular matter, nor is a wife abandoning her role if she manages the family budget or does the yard work because she's more skilled in those areas. The point of the complementary relationship between husband and wife is not to fit a particular cultural mold, but to uniquely display the goodness of God and his gospel as a couple. That's the purpose of the complementarian relationship. The submission here is not about submitting to abuse. It's not about following your husband into sin. The Lord outranks your husband. And it is not about never voicing an opinion. What submission is about is about willfully following and respecting the leadership of your husband as Christ entrusted himself to his loving father. It's about picturing the gospel in a unique way. And Peter, by the Spirit's inspiration, look what he says. He even goes so far to say that this picture of the gospel is so powerful that if your husband is not a true believer, that the Spirit might work through that to save him from his sins. That's what he says. It, the, I mean, that's incredible to me. But if a wife seeks to manipulate or subvert her husband or disrespect him in public, or gossip about him with his, her friends, the beautiful image of the gospel is lost. Christ didn't do such things with his father while he was on earth. And wives, you shouldn't do such things with your husbands. You ought to follow the example which, by which, follow the example of Christ, which will contribute to the success of your entire home. Now look, I get that the message of the Bible agitates our modern sensibilities. But it's the word of God, the infinite God. If it doesn't agitate the culture, the culture that we've imbibed, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we really reading it as the word of God? Or are we just reading our own selves into the scriptures? We must receive by faith that God is good and his ways and his ways alone are good and lead to the flourishing 
of humanity. So my first word to wives is this, is that wives submit to your own husbands. And the second word is for all women, young and old. And it's this, is that women, you do not have to flaunt your wealth or your body to be valuable or beautiful. In verses 3 and 4, we see Peter calling the women to modesty according to the particular cultural expression of his day. Now, what Peter, Peter's not laying the blame of a man's lust at the feet of women, but he's reminding the, the women and the churches that he's writing to of the unique beauty God has ordained them with. He was hoping to set them free from endlessly chasing after empty glory that always left them feeling like they were never enough. Today, Peter might write something like this. Do not let your adorning be on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. Or he might write to the young women. Do not let your adorning be found in the number of boys who do not care about you anyway, asking you to send him indecent pictures. Let me tell you plain and clear, if you're a woman in this room, you do not need such things to be valuable. You do not need such things to be beautiful. Likes are worthless. What goes viral today means nothing tomorrow. And physical beauty fades. Can we say this? The Spirit is inviting you to be set free from trying to find your worth in such temporary things. You see, God has uniquely crafted you to be beautiful with a beauty that never fades. He says, a gentle and quiet spirit that is content in who God has made you to be. Your value, if you are a woman in this room, your value does not come from others, much less some jerk. But your value comes from God, whose opinion far outweighs what anyone else thinks. And in the end, these are the women worth remembering. No one looks to Delilah as a role model, but Peter looks to Sarah, because Sarah is a picture of submission in a Christ-like home. She was no doormat, but a woman strong in her faith. And as Sarah followed Abraham, you know, think back in Genesis 12, hey, pick up and go to this land where you're going to be a stranger in your, your, your whole life. Where Sarah follows Abraham in his obedience to that charge, without fearing the hardships of life as a sojourner amidst wicked people, wives will do well to submit to their husbands without fearing the challenges of denying sinful flesh or the persecution that might result from walking in God's will. So that's my two words to the women. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Women, you do not need to flaunt your wealth or body to be beautiful or valuable. Now, I'm going to turn my attention to men in general and then focus on the husbands. First, men, use your physical strength to honor women in general and your own wives in particular. Now, this ought to go without saying, but if you're a guy in this room and you're using your strength to abuse or assault women, the Lord rebukes you. What you're doing is an abomination and you belong in jail. Abuse has no place in the kingdom of God. And to the young men in this room, the students, the teenagers, if you're texting other girls, asking for indecent pictures, grow up. You are, if you're in Christ, you reflect Christ and you reflect this church. And the Lord would never use his masculinity to do such cowardly things. The fact that men's bodies are of a generally stronger frame is supposed to be God's good gift to men and to others through men. So as men, we ought to use the strength that God has entrusted us to show him, to show honor in a variety of ways to the women in our lives and to our wives in particular. That's what Peter's talking about with this whole weaker vessels talk. He's not talking about a lesser nature for women or a lesser intellect, 
but he's just pointing out that generally men are of a stronger frame than women, and they ought to use that strength to honor those who are in their life. And then second, to husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Christ, the good shepherd, is the model Peter desires husbands to follow. Notice there's no if statements here. It's not live with your wives in an understanding way if she submits to your authority. Nor is it live with your wives in an understanding way if you're having enough intimacy that you would like to have in the house. No. The charge to husbands is not conditional. So what does it mean to live with your wives in an understanding way? I believe it's at least twofold. And I want to... Uh, this morning, and both of which are meant to be a service of showing honor to your wife. First, men are to know their wives, and not just superficially. Jesus calls each of his sheep by name, and he knows the depths of who they are, their struggles, their passions, their everything. Husbands, we must take the time to continually know our wives. We cannot rely on the past to do the heavy lifting here. Your wife is not the same as when y'all got married. Heck, she's not even the same than she was a month ago. (laughs) We must put in the effort as husbands to know our wives as Christ knows us in order that we might love them well. And then second... Men are to be patient with their wives, refusing to domineer them with our physical strength or our louder voices. When you look at the Gospel of Mark and you see the patience of our Lord with His disciples, you'll see that rash anger has no place in a Christ-like marriage. We are to display the patience of our Lord to our spouses. If a husband sharply cuts down his wife... Again, the beautiful image of the gospel is lost. For our Lord is not a harsh Lord, but one that loves us dearly and calls us friend. In fact, He is the one who in the strength of His obedience died for our weakness of sin that we might live. So men, we are to shepherd the souls of our wives with the same tender and righteous care with which Christ shepherds His church. And we will do so remembering that our wives who are in Christ are co-heirs with us, equal, equal with us as being created in the image of God and equal inheritors of the benefits of the gospel. And just look, I mean, we, this is a big deal. Look at the severity of Peter's warning that it might not hinder your prayers. This is a big deal. While the church, as a heavenly institution, unlike any other earthly institution, pictures the gospel, the earthly institution of marriage pictures the gospel unlike any other earthly institution. So a husband who in his chauvinism or his passivism, when he neglects his task as a loving shepherd, he commits a cowardly act that brings great dishonor to the Lord and discipline upon Himself. We must let the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ that we've sung about this morning, we must let the gospel empower how we live out our marriages, and particularly to the men, how we lead as husbands. And then a final word to both. A vibrant spirituality is necessary to be a Christ-like spouse. You know, there's a, a core underlying assumption that Peter has throughout this passage, and it's that, that the husbands and wives that he's talking to have a living faith. One, he's writing this letter to the churches, so he's assuming that they're participating in the congregational life of the gathered church where this letter would be read and preached. You know, they didn't have an iPhone app back then, 
codex or the Bible that you would see. They had to be connected to these local communities to read the scriptures during the week and to hear them preached on the Lord's Day. So he's assuming that they're connected to the community of the church. And then for the women, he's assuming that they know the scriptures. He's not assuming that they're novices, but they know who Sarah is. And they know how Sarah functions as an example of, of Christ and, and, and trusting himself to the Father. They understand how we should be looking to Sarah as an example to follow and an example to avoid. Peter's assuming that the women have a robust knowledge of the Scriptures. And three, he's assuming that the men are actually praying. If you're not praying, your prayers really can't be hindered. He's assuming that they're connected to the community of God's people, that they know their Bibles, and that they're active in prayer. Look, if you disconnect yourselves from the means of grace that God has provided for His people in the church, the Scriptures, and in prayer, then you're going to completely miss it when it comes to marriage. And you'll miss it if you miss the fact that they're means of grace, that there's something that you do to prove your obedience to the Lord, rather than something that God does in and through you through those things, you'll miss it altogether there. Because what I'm doing, this is not a plea for me, for you to do more in your own strength, but a plea to recognize that you need the ministry of the gospel to properly reflect the gospel. You need God's grace. For a gospel-less home can never produce a Christ-like home. God and God alone can make you a Christ-like husband or wife. We need Him. The men need Him, and the women need Him. May we not disconnect ourselves from the living community that is the local church. May we not disconnect ourselves from the living Word of God. And may we not disconnect ourselves from the throne room of God by refusing to draw near to him in prayer by the power of the Spirit and through the Son, our great high priest. But may we, as a church family, if you're a husband or your wife, may we pursue the high calling that has been given to us in the spirit of Galatians 2.20, where Paul writes that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Father, we confess that you are good. We confess that your ways are good. Oh, and God, we confess our many shortcomings. We have failed as husbands, we have failed as wives. But that's kind of the point. We can never live out your perfect standard of righteousness. But your son has come and has done so, and he is now helping us as our shepherd and overseer by the power of the Spirit who lives within us to walk in his way. So, Lord, we confess our shortcomings. And we ask for your help. We ask for your Spirit's guiding that he would lead us in the righteousness of God, that our lives would be filled with his fruit, and that our marriages, for those who are married in this room, would be pictures of the gospel, testifying of a good God and an amazing Savior. Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.